Israel and Gaza now on the verge of an all-out war. The threat comes after Hamas refused to adhere to an Egyptian proposal for a ceasefire. Israel was willing to accept the deal. That deal included the border between Gaza and Israel to be open for the transport of people and goods and a chance for the two sides to sit down in Cairo and talk about a longer-term ceasefire. Hamas made any such agreement impossible when it continued to launch rockets into Israel. So let's talk about what that might mean. Um, Edward Jeredjdin joins me now. He's a former assistant secretary of state for Near East Affairs under George H.W. Bush. He's also a former U.S. ambassador to Israel. Welcome, sir. Good to be with you, Carol. Nice to have you here. Um, in your mind, why didn't Hamas accept this peace deal or the ceasefire deal? I think there's a serious uh, rift within Hamas with the uh, militant military wing, the Al Qasim brigades. They rejected it publicly, the ceasefire proposal. But the political leadership, a couple of their spokesmen, have said that the ceasefire proposal is still under consideration. So I don't think it's a definitive rejection of a ceasefire because of the inner conflicts within Hamas itself. Interesting. Still, Hamas is still firing rockets into Israel, and Israel has every right to defend itself. Yes. If this continues, will, will Israel have the legitimacy to go into Gaza with ground troops? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. The, the, the point is that uh, Israel, as you know, under former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, unilaterally withdrew from Gaza. Gaza. They considered Gaza to be an incredible burden of occupation and uh, replete with all the problems of having Hamas there, they withdrew unilaterally. I do not think there is a real strong political will for the Israelis to go in again. That is the last option, uh, to go in militarily and to try to defeat and destroy Hamas's, uh, certainly all of its military capabilities. But that, that would involve uh, uh, untold casualties, it would involve uh, a great international uproar. And so there, that's the last option Israel would want to use. But it is poised. As you know, uh, Carol, they have uh, uh, at least 40 to 50,000 Israeli res reservists that have been called up. And that is the last option that Prime Minister Netanyahu has in his pocket. Well, you know, I ask you that question because some feel that this is the time. You mentioned this split in Hamas leadership. So why not go in? and? and take care of Hamas once and for all. You know, we've seen this film before, uh, 2008, 2012. Going in in a full-scale uh, military ground invasion into Gaza is replete with political consequences, and many of them could be negative. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not a decision to be taken easily. I think what the Israelis want is a, some sort of uh, tenuous guarantees that after they have reduced to some extent Hamas's military capabilities over the last week, uh, their military coordinator Amos Gilad made a statement that the Israelis have uh, uh, achieved some serious damage on Hamas's military capabilities during the last uh, week or 10 days. What they want is an extended period of calm. They want to maintain the status quo. In other words, a ceasefire, calm, without having to go in into uh, Gaza uh, militarily on the ground and to really maintain the status quo on the West Bank also. My personal view on this is that this is a short-term tactical strategy, but in the long term, we're going to see this repeated. And one day, it is going to get out of control with devastating consequences for all sides, for the Israelis, the Palestinians, and the international community. So, so the U.S. Secretary was about to, to go into the region to try to broker some sort of ceasefire. He changed his mind and sort of left it up to Egypt. Was that the right move? Well, I think he thought, uh, probably Secretary Kerry thought that the Egyptians had uh, made some real progress on getting the parties together to discuss, a, to agree to a, a ceasefire in the beginning and then to discuss the terms. As it turned out, that was not the case. So he may very well uh, reconsider uh, his trip. But let me make one point, Carol. Before all of this happened, in April, uh, Secretary Kerry's uh, uh, very uh, sustained initiative to get the Israelis and Palestinians, uh, Netanyahu and Abu Mazen, to come to a peace agreement just floundered and ended, unfortunately, in failure. When 
there is no hope for a peace agreement. And we've seen this consistently in recent Middle East history. When there's no hope, bad things happen. After that, we had the, uh, the kidnapping of the three Israelis and their, and their uh, uh, murder. Mm -hmm. And then the murder of this uh, young uh, Palestinian uh, boy. Then we had Israel did some military activities against Hamas targets in the West Bank. Hamas started lobbying its rockets, lobbying its rockets against Israel, and the whole situation escalated. That's sort of the immediate context of where we're at. Uh, but this is not sustainable in the long run. If all that's going to happen, and I hope it happens at least, is a ceasefire, we have to get on to a long-term solution of the problem which is really as improbable as it seems an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement. I, it does sound impossible, but I hope there's, I don't know, I don't know, hope springs eternal, right? It, I don't know, though, <laughs> Mr. Ambassador. It, it's not impossible, but it's, it, it, it's not impossible, but it's the only long-term solution. And if there is, if we don't have that, we're going to continue to see this film replayed and replayed. Mr. Ambassador, thanks for your insight. I appreciate it. Still to come in the newsroom, the 